Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NCC. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our next guest, which is Dr. John Tekel. Dr. John Tekel is a medical doctor and international speaker, best-selling author and television personality who spent several decades traveling and studying the health, well-being and longevity of patterns of people all around the world. The good doctor and his wife, Sue, have five children and multiple grandchildren. Dr. John played first grade football for the Hawthorne Hawks in the 1960s, produced the number one top 40 hit record and has books published across many countries. He applies his own personal formula of activity, eating and coping skills, which draws on his medical experience, extensive international research and the lifestyle patterns of the longest living people on earth, the Okinawans. Dr. John is a different kind of medical doctor. His refreshing and memorable message changes people's lives for the better. And I can't wait for you all to hear what he has to say. So, but without further ado, Dr. John, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Zahir, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with you. Oh, it's an honor to have you here. I mean, just a quick bit of history. I, I saw you speak probably a good 20 years ago down in Melbourne, and I was inspired and I, I purchased your book, which was Laughter, Sex, Vegetable and Fish. It's, it's quite a funny, but uh, I suppose truthful title. <laughs> but uh, I'd love to know um, where did this all start from you? Like, where did this passion of yours come from to, you know, you're a football player. Where did that passion come from to study, for example, the longest living race of people on earth? And yeah. Yeah, so here I, when I was in final year high school, I assumed I was going to become a teacher because I like people and I like getting on with them, conversing with them. And I thought I had enough knowledge of life at the ripe age of whatever I was, 17 or 18, finishing high school, to yep. be able to engage with people and teach them a few things. And so we did our exams and my best friend said, uh, John, like you're still gonna be a teacher? And I said, I believe so. He said, well, I'm going to be a medical doctor. I've got enough marks to get into the University of Melbourne. Why don't you join me? <laughs> so I checked all the, the marks. I don't know what the score was called back then. And I, I had enough marks. Unbelievable. So I joined him as a medical student, first year at the Melbourne University. And we did the regular things that uh, university boys did and girls, obviously. Uh, we went to the cafe and drank a lot of coffee and had a beer or two and played pool. Uh, and then I joined the university football team and enjoyed that. So uh, when you get towards the end of medicine, you learn things in medical school about diagnosis of disease mm -hmm. and you learn about cures. And cures in those days sort of, tended to go one of two ways. You either did surgery, uh, if in doubt, cut it out, was the mantra. And the other course of action, if it wasn't a surgical procedure, then you wrote a prescription for medications. Mm. And medications in those days, and still are, usually invented in laboratories, a mm. mixture of chemicals that sort of cured diseases. Then I set up with a couple of friends who graduated in the same year, I set up a general practice in a semi-rural community. I became a part-time obstetrician and delivered several hundred babies, uh, first day of life. Uh, after a while, Zahir, I started to wonder why so many people got sick mm. and why they came to the local general practitioner to talk about things because they were worried. The expectation in those days, and it probably still is, is the patient felt uh, disenfranchised if they didn't walk, walk out with a prescription. Not yeah. a verbal prescription, but you, you, you literally had to write something on a piece of paper, which they took around to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist gave them some drugs, in inverted commas, to fix them. And after three or four years, I, I didn't get bored. I started to wonder why do people get sick? Mm. And I started to get interested in the basis of wellness. So do you know the difference between illness and wellness? Mm. The spelling is exactly the same, except for the I in front of illness and the we, W-E, in front of wellness. wellness yeah. So, you know, when you're a community, 
the we, you can support, you look at, you look after people, you discuss things with people. Mm. But if you become a loner and start to do things without, let's call them role models in your life, then it becomes an I thing. And so wellness can quickly turn into illness. Mm. So I started to study books and notes and I flew to California on a thing called a jumbo jet, Pan American. And I was scared stiff when it took off because all the lockers opened and luggage fell out. Anyway, I got, I got to California and I went out the back of um, Santa Monica and this guy, he was in his early 90s. He was giving lectures on wellness. And I'd heard the term, but as a medical student, I didn't know anything about wellness. So this guy was teaching about things called nutrition you know, what we ate. Mm. And he referred to a guy called Hippocrates, the Greek father of medicine, supposedly. Yes. Uh, food is thy medicine and medicine is thy food. And he made all these amazing quotes, which yes. made me think more deeply. And when I flew back home, I started to talk to patients about what they were eating. Mm. And they said, no, doctor, I'm here because I'm sick. You know, I've, I've got a fever or I've got an itch or I've got a, a scratch. Or, uh, <laughs> Um, yes. And I want a prescription. Yes. But then as I wandered through life as a general practitioner and you found yourself prescribing new drugs like Valium and antidepressants and things, mm. <laughs> and you wondered whether people, if they were eating better, mm. more natural things that came out of the ground and grew on trees, rather than going to, uh, you know, we, we call it fast food in the Western world, fast food. Yes. So I started to travel and travel and travel, and I came across a group of people who lived off the southern end of Japan, the islands of Okinawa. And the big island of Okinawa is a microcosm of life over the last 100 years. The elders live in villages. The elders are respected. So the older you got in the islands of Okinawa, the more you're respected. Yes. See, the study started in 45, 1945. So and the studies were going for 70, 75 years on real people, real time. And, you know, the, the latest study, if you leave, read the latest study, study, study in, in the Sunday newspapers or Cleo magazine or something, you know, the latest research says, the article is always the latest research study. Yeah, yeah. It was done on seven left-handed mice over three, three days, <laughs> you know. But the study was done on the mice at the University of Nowhere by yeah. Professor Nobody. So the real, real Fair Dinkum research in the Islands of Okinawa was done over 70 years. They did a wow. centenarian study and they, they measured and looked at all the data from hundreds of hundred-year-olds. Yeah, right. I mean, have we ever done a study in the Western, Western world on hundred-year-olds yeah. and how they live their life and what they eat? And so we started to look at the differences between the islands of Okinawa and us hmm. in Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, Australia, Los Angeles, New York, Paris, Rome. The differences were vast. Hmm. We retire. The Okinawan dialect of Japanese doesn't have a word called retire. I mean, no, you know, the people who spoke English said, what, what, you're tired. You want to get, <laughs> re you want to get retired. How does that work? Like, what do you do? Well, oh, you know, we saw you get you do the garden and you read books and you watch television and talk on your phone. Yeah, but yeah, but what do you do? <laughs> so the other interesting thing in the the food department is that they live on eighteen to twenty two plant varieties every day. Yeah, right. They only eat meat when they can catch it. The way we eat meat, we walk down the aisles of the supermarket and just grab all this meat and you take it home and stick it in your fridge hmm. and it's cold and frozen so you can eat meat every day. Yeah. I mean, they, they ate red meat maybe once a month, once when they could catch a beast hmm. and they'd celebrate and put it on the fire and, and eat it all at once, you know, but then they would live on plant food for hmm. the rest of the month. So 18 to 22 different plant foods. And do you know where they grew it? Next door. In the field. Mm. Yes. So the average meal in America today and probably Australia has travelled, all the ingredients have travelled 1,350 miles, yes. 2,000 kilometres. Crazy. 
I mean, in Australia, we import apples from California. Why? We import fish from, from Asia. Why? We can plenty of fish. I mean, we're crazy, you know. And so the other thing that they didn't understand in Okinawa when we were talking about agriculture, they'd never heard of what we call conventional farming. I mean, we spray pesticides on our, on our crops. Yeah, and insecticides, and we add hormones, growth hormones, and we we add antibiotics. Mm. Like seventy mm. percent of the world's antibiotics are fed to animals that we eat. <sighs> so what the heck are we doing to our bodies? You know, and people say, "Oh no, 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 no I, I wash my fruit and vegetables." I said, "Yeah, but the, the pesticides are in the food. Yeah, they go into your human body and they build up what's called bioaccumulation. The poisons, the toxins are in your body." Yeah. And 50% of the, our pesticide load happens in childhood, in developing bodies. I mean, are we crazy or are we serious about living? It's, it's so, like, like gone out of our way to harm ourselves. Uh, well, uh, Hippocrates, um, he's, in Greek, it's, it's a saying called primum no serum something something in Latin. And it means first do no harm. So what are we doing to ourselves day after day after day? We're doing harm. We sit in front of television sets. We've got mobile phones. I mean, 90% of us in Australia and America spend 90% of our time still yeah. sitting, eating, yeah. lying in bed, lounging on the sofa. Oh, I'm tired. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest and watch television. You know, click, click. And, and the kids, they grow up. I mean, when I was a little kid, you used to be home by dark. You know, mum, you've got to be home by dark. We're playing footy and cricket in the street. Yeah. The ground, ground's playing stones in the gutter and stuff. Oh, but you might get dirty. <laughs> hey, we used to have in the 1940s, 2% of our kids got allergies. Now it's, now it's 40%. Everyone's got an allergy because we've, we've lost the basics of living. Mm. Mm. So it's interesting that in our modern life, I've now dissected and you see, you know, marketing, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. The principles of a long, healthy life are the ACE skills of life. A is activity. C is coping. That's got a new name, coping. It's called stress management or mental illness or something like that. Yeah. And then E is eating, what the food you put in your face, you know. And the other thing about anatomy 101 the human system, intestines, the wide end is called your mouth, that's the hole at the top, and the bottom end is called the bottom end, the other end, and that's this big. So the top end is that big and the, and the, the bottom is that big, and we fill the top of the pipe with all this junk and muck and everything and, you know, chocolates and donuts and KFCs and all that sort of stuff, mm. and all the poisons build up inside of us. Yeah. So Bowel cancer is our second biggest cancer in the Western world. In Australia, 77 bowel cancer patients die every week. Wow. 11 a day. I mean, what are we doing to ourselves? So, nice. so here we have to get back to basics with the activity, the coping, the eating. And, and the other thing about life at the moment is it's scary. Mm. Now, there's a thing called a pandemic. There's a little virus. What is it called? COVID or something, right? Yeah, that, that thing. Now, the difference between an epidemic, that's sort of in a local area, and a pandemic, that means the pandemic, it crosses borders. Australia's sort of lucky because we're an island, right? Hmm. So we brought in rules as to stop people coming in from overseas because yeah. you, can't, you can't see a virus. And a virus mutates. A bacteria doesn't change it. DNA, mm -hmm. a virus can change its genetic material. So when a virus infects a cell in your body, Zahir, the body cell has got two options. If you've got a good immune system, mm. the body cell will beat up the virus and kill it. Yes. If you've got a weak immune system, your cell becomes a virus factory. And that virus can mutate within one day, a hundred to a thousand times, and then it spreads. Wow. See, the biggest pandemic in the last hundred years, people say, oh, you know, the Spanish flu killed 50 million people a hundred years ago. This pandemic is killing a lot of people around the world. I said, yeah, a lot. It's killed nearly 3 million people. The biggest pandemic in the last hundred years 
is called the effects of cigarette smoking. So in Australia last year, 909 people were killed by COVID. In the last year, 21,000 people killed themselves with cigarette smoking. And lung cancer is the biggest cancer in the world. So, you know, we, when you talk about decisions and priorities and bringing up kids, you know, you could ask your kid, like for dinner tonight, do you want poisons with a side of antibiotics and some hormones? That's like, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, it's fascinating to chat to people about what we're doing to ourselves yeah. and whether people are smart enough, intelligent enough to make the decisions in life that are going to affect tomorrow. Mm. Because because everything is immediate gratification, isn't it? And that's why we've gotten in this habit of just feeding ourselves whatever we can find at the stores, not taking that time. I remember uh, when the pandemic hit, you know, we, we all had some time off, which was great for, uh, with the family. I started growing, got time to start growing veggies out the back and some herbs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I was very successful with the cucumbers. They did, they did well. And uh, But the interesting thing that I said to my wife was, uh, you know, pick, I'd pick the cucumbers off the tree and then would leave them in the fridge. But within two to three days, maybe four at max, they were soft. Mm -hmm. And I said to my wife, imagine what we're buying from the stores. We get them, they're still hard. They seem to stay hard in the fridge for over a week or two. And they've traveled from probably some other country to get here. What mm -hmm. the hell are we eating? If, if well, we're... don't forget that food is manipulated in transit and stored, uh, it's got colorings, it's got mm. preservatives, it's got yep. chemicals making the food look good because people say to me, oh, organic food doesn't look very good. I said, that's because it hasn't got any like pump up, hey, look at me. It's a bit yeah. like, it's a bit like, you know, young women having plastic surgery to look <laughs> better. Well, your fruit and vegetables are having plastic surgery to look better. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's really interesting at our perception of life and what we look at. And so some of the key things you found from studying the Okinawas and people like that is obviously they ate generally stuff that came out of the ground. Uh, and I remember reading your book, you were talking about eat no matter what you do every day, make it a goal to eat 15 plant foods every day, things that come out of the ground, whether it's nuts, fruit, you know, vegetables. Uh, they're also very active people. Um, so that's one thing that you mentioned. You know, we're, we're spending 90% of our time, as you said, sitting down. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Okinawans were very active. And I think in your book, you said something along the lines of there's no distinction between a 40-year-old and an 80-year-old. Is that correct? Uh, the, the aging process over there with all the data banks comparing Western people and the Okinawans on the big island, uh, there is way less cancer, virtually zero diabetes. I mean, diabetes in Australia, it's the fastest, diabetes is the fastest growing epidemic in human history. Yeah. In Australia, there's a new diabetic every four minutes. Wow. We have we have a hundred thousand new diabetics a year. I mean, you know, type one diabetic diabetes. Type one is a pre. It's a genetic predisposition in terms of lack of insulin production. But type two diabetes is our fault. It's you looking in the mirror. What have I done to my body to deserve diabetes? Where well, you've really stuffed up, haven't you? You're, yeah. you're, in, you're inactive. You can't cope with modern life, mm. and you're eating you're eating junk. You're eating fake food. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. One thing that hasn't been really discussed, I think, and you, you've touched on the immune system. So our immune system. Um, it wasn't really. It was. I, I got frustrated watching the news and looking at all the stuff the government was putting out when COVID hit because I was thinking, well, why aren't we talking about ways to raise our immune levels, get some more vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, you know, these kind of things to actually boost our immune system, but it wasn't really talked about. So uh, I'd love it if you could just, um, you know, touch on that, you know, what should we be doing more of these days to really help lift our immune systems up? Okay, our immune system is an inbuilt, it's a system because it's multifactorial, like your immune system consists of white blood cells, B cells, B lymphocytes, uh, B because they come from bone marrow, T lymphocytes come from your thymus gland, uh, and the immune system is the spleen and the liver and all the lymph nodes, those little, little lymph nodes in your groin and your under your armpits and all that sort of stuff. So if you get a scratch on your leg or if a virus enters your body, 
your immune system goes into action hmm. and it starts to, I call it the goodies versus the baddies. Your immune system is all these goodies, the white cells that come, you know, the cancer killer cells and all that. They come and have a fight. It's a bit like, it's, you know, you're down the back street in a big city and, and somebody jumps at you. They're the, they're the nasties, the viruses and the bacteria. Uh, and then you, the goody goodies in your body starts to fight. Mm. And if your immune system is good, I have a rating scale of zero to 100. So as people age, your production of white cells starts to drop down. Mm. And that happens with the aging process. But the most important thing with your immune system right now is you. You look in the mirror. So let's say, I'm going to ask you, Zahir, yeah. how many hours do you sleep a night? Would it be six, seven, eight? Personally, six to seven. Okay, let's say seven. That seems to be the average in corporate Australia. I'm, I'm stating corporate Australia because most of my research has been in corporates and companies who yeah. pay me to do the research and build people's immune systems. So if you sleep for seven hours, there are 24 hours in a day, how many hours does that mean you're awake for every day? Uh, 17. 17, good maths. Uh, how many half hours in 17 hours? 34. So in a week, you're awake for 238 half hours. Now to score well with your immune system, are you committed? in the last same month, have you done 30 minutes, six times of the 238 half hours you're awake in a week, have you moved continuously for six of those half hours? Yes. In an aerobic fashion, aerobic is Latin for with oxygen. So mm -hmm. if you're rhythmically using large muscle groups as in walking, yes. uh, cycling, swimming, something that moves every muscle in your body, then you qualify for a good rating in the activity part of your immune system. Okay. So now, most people in Australia, most adults in Australia are lucky if they go for a 10 minute walk a week. What? I mean, that, that, yeah, you said what? That's facts. I mean, see, the Okinawans don't have elevators, they walk upstairs. <laughs> if you live on the, if you live or, work on the sixth or seventh story of a building, like you, you go into the lobby and you press the button. But there are stairs. Yeah, good point. I mean, why don't you walk up? There? Oh, don't be stupid. I'm in a hurry. Oh, okay, so you've got to wait with 400 other people to get in the elevator. That's called non-social non distancing. <laughs> I mean, if, so I've seen people complain that they can't get a, a car park within 10 metres of the supermarket exit. I mean, but I had to park way over there. I said, God, yeah, you've got to push the trolley for 50 metres. Yeah, <laughs> don't do anything, right? Yeah. So there's rule number one for your listeners, our, our listeners. Let's, right. let's pretend you all sleep for seven hours average a night. That means you're awake for 17, like I hear. So you're awake for 34 half hours a day and you're awake for 238 half hours a week. So do you move continuously for six of it? Yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, I bet you don't. No, oh, what? <laughs> so and the uh, let's go to the AC, let's go to the, e the eating. Easy. Now, question. What percentage of your intake per meal would be plant food? Oh, hang on, mate. You know, I had a steak like, hey, if you go to the best restaurant in town, you know, the waiter, the waitress comes and say, oh, sir, madam, you know, what would you like? You know, a steak, chicken or fish? And you go, oh, I'll have a steak. So they deliver you the steak, the plate's that big, and this steak is like half a cow. It's overlapping the sides of the plate. Oh, you know, madam, you know, is there some vegetables? Yeah, carrots are $5 and spinach is $7.50. Imagine going to a Malaysia or a Taiwanese Marapa restaurant and paying extra for the broccoli. I mean, are we stupid? <laughs> so the plant food. Now, here's the question. Okay. Is more than 50% of your food intake in a day, in a week, more than 50%? Is it plant food or not? Right. Well, yeah, you can answer, Zahir. Yes. Is, yes. Okay, well, you score well. And the other question about eating is, 
HI, human interference. Uh. Would you think that 60, 70, 80% of the food you eat is low HI? In other words, it has been interfered with or stuffed up by a human being? Is it natural out of the tree or out of the ground? Or is 70% just, you know, crap? And people say, you can't say crap. I said, no, no, that's an acronym for commercially refined and processed. So here's 70% of food in America and Australia is commercially refined and processed. It's messed up by human beef. Mm. I mean, if you have a can of fan or a can of cake, why don't they put on the label, hey, there are 11 teaspoons of added sugar in this? I mean, you, you listen to the World Health Organization, which we don't. I do. I'm a medical doctor. I'm here to help people live, you know, long and healthy lives. The biggest According to the World Health Organization, the biggest intake of calories for our overweight kids, don't forget, we're now in the top five overweight kids in the OECD countries. Congratulations, us. Top five overweight kids. And don't forget, overweight kids become overweight adults. And overweight adults get type 2 diabetes and heart attacks and heart disease and yeah. cancer, more cancers. You know, choose your cancer, overweight, 16 different cancers. Yeah. So... Uh, don't forget that the WHO has told us six months ago the biggest intake of, of excess calories, excess kilojoules for children is soft drinks. Right. So if you've got soft drinks in your fridge, you're dumb. Mm. See, you talk about, or we're talking about immunity. Mm. See, when you're born, Zahir, you've got a genetic imprint. So immunity starts with your genes. If you've chosen healthy parent, healthy parents, you've done well. Mm. If you've chosen unwell parents with low immunity, you're behind the eight ball. Now, the first immune booster is when the baby's born, and I delivered 400 babies, you place the babe on its mother's chest. Yes. So there's, there's skin contact. So let me ask you one of the one percenters in life. Have you hugged someone you loved in the last 48 hours? Yes. Imagine how many people in the world have not hugged someone, even a pet, you no know, cat, a dog, anything. You hugged anything you loved in the last 48 hours. It's the touching. The second thing that happens to a human being with inbuilt immunity is breast milk. Oh. So cow's milk is good for baby cows, and human milk is very good for human beings, little babies, because of the immune boost it gives you. So then we get to a stage where we walk around and we eat. Now, one of the amazing things I see when I walk into a supermarket, I don't know why they're called supermarkets. See, ordinary markets are a lot better than the supermarkets. Correct. Now, if you walk up, the, up and down the aisles of a supermarket, there are about 155 different types of baby food. Mm. Now, the longest living, healthiest people on earth have never heard of baby food the little kids eat what the parents eat they just mash it up or something pour a bit of milk on it you know yeah. like why do we need baby food mm -hmm. like it's immune like, like it's an immune destroyer i mean how much human interference how much added sugar how much added salt you know, how many pesticides are in the you know the human interfered with food so back to basics so the immune system then, as you grow up, is all to do with activity. So are you playing ball with your kids in the park? What park? Like if you go to New York and buy an apartment, it's this big and there's no backyard. And it's got a, it's got a microwave. Two thirds, nearly two thirds of meals prepared in America and over half in Australia are not prepared in the home. Yeah. It's, it's take out or eat out, take away. Oh, it's faster. It's better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's take one food, a potato. The Irish have lived on potatoes for hundreds of years. Mm. Potato, good food. It's good carbohydrate. Yes. And, oh, don't forget that word carbohydrate. America wrecked the word, then they wrecked the food. Carbohydrate in America is now called carbs. Mm. Real carbohydrates have got hydrate in it. What's, hey, Zahir, what's hydrate? Uh, it, water. It's water. Mm. So fruits and vegetables have got hydrate. You know, we're told we have to drink eight glasses of drink eight glasses of water a day. 
in Asia, in the villages and stuff, they don't need a glass of water a day because they're hydrating themselves with real carbohydrate foods, vegetables mm. and fruits, all those sort of things. Yeah? Interesting, huh? Mm. So getting back to the what you put in your mouth to get 15 different plant foods a day, there's a meal called break, breakfast. Now, breakfast started off as two words. It's called break fast. But somebody 200 years ago was in a hurry. They were very stressed. They said, oh, breakfast. So they got quick and they squashed the two words together, breakfast. It's break. So breakfast, break fast, breaks a 17-hour fast between dinner tonight and lunch tomorrow. Oh, I haven't got time for breakfast. I said, what do you do for breakfast? Oh, no, I just have a cup of coffee and run out the door. And then, you know, if you don't break your fast with fibre, fibre is plant food. Yes. It works as a sponge. So when you eat a lot of fibrous food, like in natural plant food, the fibre goes through your body, very little is absorbed, but the fibre soaks up all the poisons and toxins and soaks up cholesterol and yeah. sweeps them out of your body. Oh, I haven't got time for breakfast, so I just have a coffee. I said, well, good luck. You know, don't forget that 11 Australians die every day from bowel cancer because they didn't need enough fibre. Just little things like that. Oh, you know, that little hole down the bottom and the diverticulitis and all these new diseases called uh, irritable bowel syndrome. The Okinawans have never heard of IBS, never heard of it. They've never heard of colitis, inflammation of the colon, because people who eat, live on real food don't get bowel inflama inflammation there. So break fast, you would have some grains, whole grains, not mushed up, you know, po cocoa poppy whoppies or whatever they're called. It's whole, so the only three cereals I've seen in a supermarket that are whole grains are wheat bix, fighter bricks, and oats. And oats, okay. Not 90% plus whole grain. The rest are human interfered with, they're just wrecked. Uh, and then you have some fresh fruits. Oh, what do you mean fresh fruits? I've got a few oranges. I say, yeah, but let's see, have you ever heard of an FP100, Zahir? It sounds no, like I don't know what it is. Yeah, you might have read in the book, it's a fruit platter that lives in your fridge 100% of the time. Oh, my kid won't eat fruit. I said, yes, they will. If you've got a fruit platter with little bits and pieces of chopped up seven different fruits, seven, it'll take me hours. It takes you five minutes every two days. And the kids go, you know, they all the grandkids run, Nana, where's the, where's the FB100? Yeah, in the fridge. And they go like this, you know, after school and stuff. Kids love fruit. If it's prepared, I mean, an orange is all sticky and everything and it's got peel and everything. But if you chop the fruit up for the little kids in little bits and pieces, they love it. You know? Fantastic. Mm. So let's say you have some grains and three or four different fruits with your breakfast. Oh, but I'm not going to eat a whole pear. I said, well, don't. Chop it up into little bits and you just have a few bits and put the rest in the fridge. Right? Okay. Mm. Now let's say you've got five, six plant foods for breakfast. What did you have for lunch yesterday, Zahid? So if I had some uh, pasta. Yeah, okay. So if it's refined pasta, you're just eating flour and sugar. Mm. Uh, if it's whole grain pasta. It's, uh, it was spelt pasta, uh, mushrooms and... Okay. Oh, yeah. no, yes. so it's interesting that the pasta that is made in America and Australia is usually highly refined. Yeah. So all the, all the grains and everything have been smashed a bit. Mm. Um, see... Pasta, spaghetti and everything was uh, like pizza and pasta. It was, oh, the, the Italians invented it. See, pasta used to be part of a meal, a little bowl of pasta in an Italian meal with six or seven different little plates and stuff. So. Not, but not now, well, you're now in America, you have to have pasta. You know, it's like a football field. <laughs> so it's just refined flour and sugar and, yeah. and you know, we say, oh, pasta is very good for you. Yeah, very good for what? Making you fat. So, <laughs> no, little bits. You know, pasta used to be part of an Italian meal. So then, uh, so anyway, let's let's pretend you're in the city and you're busy and everything. I say, oh, you know, well, I'm just going to drop down and get some Maccas. So why don't you drop, drop down to the sandwich shop and ask for two slices of whole grain bread and yeah, but then, you know, question, doctor, do you have butter or mar margarine? I said, well, no, a scrape of avocado. See, this, we haven't got time for all this stuff here, but there are different sorts of fat. Saturated fat is animal fat. Hmm. That's to the inside of your arteries. 
And by the way, your three coronary arteries, your major coronary arteries that keep your heart alive, are one fifth the width of your little finger. That one, one fifth the width of that. That's how wide your three major coronary arteries are. Yeah, now, right. if, you, if you get a bit of sludge in there and a little little uh, clot of blood comes and, and gets stuck there, you're going to have a heart attack. Now, if a little bit of your heart dies, the rest of the heart's collateral circulation can keep you alive and you only have a heart attack and you just go to hospital for a few days and have a bypass or a stent or something. But then if a, a big load of your heart dies, you drop dead. Now, in Australia, every 90 seconds, somebody just literally drops dead. So the first symptom in 30% of people with heart disease is sudden death, and that's bloody hard to cure. So why would you want to fill your arteries up with saturated fat when there are other sort of fats like uh, unsaturated fats, and which is plant fats, and the best is monounsaturated fat. The best example of monounsaturates are avocado and olives. Olives, okay. Yeah. So if you're going to cook, you know, people have all these various sort of fats and all this sort of stuff. So what's wrong with olive? Olive oil is the safest, best, healthiest fat in the world. Okay. From pure virgin olive oil, the olives that run the fastest. People say, oh, it costs too much. I say, what's too much? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you only need a little bit of oil in the pan and all sort of it's it's olive oil, it's safe as safe as remember Pop Popeye? Yes, spinach. What was his girlfriend's name? Olive. Olive oil, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was a smart guy. So yeah, so the eating eating, you've got to be having 70% of your intake of food as plant, less flesh. Now the best flesh in the world is fish. Fish. Deep, deep sea ocean fish, not hormone fed, you know, fish, for, which farm fish is full of hormones and pellets and all that sort of stuff. Deep sea ocean fish. People say there aren't enough fish. I say, well, in my fish shop, there's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's your, so your recommendation is to basically stay away from red meat, which I don't actually eat much. No, no, not stay away from it. Uh, oh. Just pretend you're a hunter. Okay. And you, and you can only catch it maybe once a week and you just have, but you see, a serve is the palm of your hand, a serve of meat. Okay. Not half a cow. Yeah. Right? Because when you have a serve at the palm size on your plate, you've got plenty of room for the plant food. If you have a steak that, that big, yeah. there's room for the real food, huh? So, you know, I have a steak, uh, like a little bit of fillet steak or something two or three times, but I wouldn't go near ham or sausages i mean they're just full of fat they're processed meats there yeah. and it's, if, if you listen to the world cancer research fund you probably never heard of them but neither of your listeners but their yeah. history of research over 50 years if you eat more than 500 grams of red meat a week for every 100 grams over 500 grams of red meat a week not a meal your risk of bowel cancer increased by seven percent so our risk, if you're going to eat red meat every day, I wish you the best, you know, and I hope you have a... It's really interesting, that test. Have you ever heard of the Occult blood test that they send to people over 50 in the mail? No. Where, where you do a little test on your on your poo and never heard of the Occult blood test. Uh, I, think, I think the government's decided now, the health department, that every person over the age of 50 is posted... Oh, right. ...a little Occult blood test. Okay. The return of that is less than 40%. I mean, people say, oh, I don't care. I'll never get bowel cancer. So, hello, 77 people a week die of bowel cancer. So, you know, testing for blood, occult blood, and blood that you can't see hmm. is very important. And then every now and again, if you've certainly, if you've got a history of bowel cancer in your family, you have to have a colonoscopy. People yeah. say, what? I said, that's a guy, the doctor with the wavy tube, it sticks it up your back passage. Wow, does it hurt? I said, no, 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 they give you a shot or something. You're floating around the roof. It's beautiful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so last question for you, Zahir, on the eating. Yes. What percentage of your food do you reckon has got low human interference? Would it be half or a bit more or way less than half? Low human interference. I'd say half. Yeah, okay. Hmm. And then the coping thing. A lot of people say to me, Doc, you know, it's incredible. I've been under 
under a lot of stress lately. Okay. Uh, there's no stress out there to be under. Stress is a response to a pressure. So let's pretend I put the same pressure on you, Zahir, and two other people. Mm. Now let's pretend the pressure was not a deal that you're doing with your, your business or in a meeting in the workplace, in the boardroom. Let's pretend I'm going to put you on the MCG on the last Saturday in September in a thing called the Grand Final. Mm -hmm. Now, you have got coping skills, but would you cope well with that certain circumstance? Would you have a positive reaction, a neutral reaction? Now, I've got a hammy, I'm not playing. Or a negative reaction, you'd be out there and you'd get belted and your opponent would kick three goals in the first three minutes and be taken off. So in life, in real life, when people are put under the same pressure, if they've been trained for it, mm. if they've got support systems, if they've got a coach or a partner that's with them, mm. then they're going to cope better than if you're a loner and you say, oh, you know, I don't care what happens to me, I'm going to fix it. You know, I'm that tough. I say, okay, you're tough. Are you physically tough, mentally tough? Have you been there before? Do you know how to handle these circumstances? So when people in real life can't cope, they build up negative stress responses with hormone increases, uh, the cortisone increases, and your resistance, your immune system is, is crucified by a lot of can't cope pressure. Hmm. So not the stress you're under, it's the pressure you're under and how you cope with it. Mm. So learning, experience, having colleagues, having support. It's a bit like seeing a psychiatrist. They don't tell you what to do when you walk in the door. You, you know, they just sit there with their notepad and you sit there and lie on the couch or something. And the psychiatrist asks you a couple of questions and then you start talking. And you say, yeah, but like, you know, let's say this, you know, things with like domestic violence. I mean... It's mm. almost become a normal thing. Yeah, sure. Like, why, why would a person go home, have, a, have four whiskeys, and everything's negative, 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 and, and then take violent action against a person you know and love? I mean, why would you do that? Because you can't cope, right? So whose fault is it? Is it the community? Is it your partner? Is it your law firm? Is it your boss? Or is it your fault, right? Because you haven't learned to cope with life. You're inactive, you eat crap, mm. and you can't, you can't cope. I mean, we, we, we watch the media. I mean, when I was a little boy, the news had come on every night at 6 o'clock. Yep. Now you're on CNN or Fox or Sky or something, there's news every 30 minutes. Yeah. Oh, breaking news, you know. And so most of the news is negative. You know, yeah. there's... There's, there's wars, there's murders, there's terrorism, there's mountains grow, blowing up, there's tsunamis, there's, mm. there's, there's road tolls, there's negative, negative, negative. That negative sells. If you, if, if you print an, a current affair, negative, negative, negative. So media laps up negativity. I've yeah. got a new presentation in the corporate world now and or any organisation. It's called the karma of life. Okay. And karma is spelt with a C. It's an acronym. So the C is culture. Culture. The A, the A is attitude. Is it partly sunny or partly cloudy? The R is resilience. What's resilience? Resilience is it's dealing with ups and downs of life. It's dealing with negative emotions. It's dealing with loss. It's dealing with mm. it's dealing with sorrow. You know, I met with Richard Branson once at a conference and he was uh, very gracious and he invited me into his dressing room for five minutes. We had a chat. I said, so, Richard, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah, one. He said, is it about business? I said, no, no. I said, it's about life. What's a tip you can give me about life? He said, yesterday is the past. You can't change the past, but you can learn from it. Never make same mistake twice. The future is for those who plan for it. People who plan for the future do better than people who don't. 
And today is a gift. That's why they call it a present. Today is the present. It's a gift to you. Use it wisely. So the past is gone. Learn from your mistakes. The future is the future. Plan for it. Today is the present. It's a gift. So that meant a lot to me. Mm. So the past of the past. So if you have grief, if you lose money, if your share price goes down there, if there's a Mount Vesuvius blows up uh, and you survive. I mean, you know, my example is me with, I was, I had a seizure on an airplane 11 years ago and the the plane landed, the ambulance was on the tarmac and whisked me into St. Vincent's Hospital. Wow. And I had all those scans done and and my wife was there and they came in and said, doctor, uh, you know, you've got bad news, you've got brain cancer. Wow. And then the, I was whisked up to the ward and then the surgeon came in and he said, I said, what sort of brain cancer it is? I knew a bit about medicine. Yeah. And he said, I can't tell you until tomorrow. I said, what happens tomorrow? He said, we do, we do a biopsy. I said, how do you do that? He said, we bore a hole in your head. And then that goes to pathology and then we tell you what sort of cancer it is. You're right. And, wow. and when, when you're diagnosed with cancer, you have, you immediately think, that you're going to die and your life flashes before your eyes it's a bit like mm. when you're in a plane a boeing max you know that's going to hit the ground in 1.3 minutes or something yeah your life flashes before your eyes and you think of you think of your friends those you thought were friends and the real friends mm. and you think of your kids and your family and all that sort of stuff and then i had a thought that I knew a lot about cancer as being a, a doctor and yeah, there's a survival rate. Mm. So when I had the biopsy and the, the pathologist sent through the results and I had a, what they call a CNS lymphoma and then, you know, Dr. Google said I had between 15 months and two years. You're right. But I was the first patient in Australia to sign that I was going to be the first to trial a new immunotherapy drug on, um, on the, at the same time as two chemo drugs. And my oncologist, he was a Malayan guy who'd been studying in New York. And I said, if you were me, would you sign this to be on the trial? And he said, it's a, the only chance you've got. And so I signed on the, on the dotted line. And then, then I had visions of, you know, the chemo and the immuno drugs mm. inside as the goodies you know, chasing the cancer cells and bashing them up, the goodies versus the baddies. Yeah, right. And, but he did explain to me, he said, he said, John, he said, we've done all the tests and PET scans and all over your body. It seems like you're pretty healthy. And I said, well, how can I be healthy if I've got brain cancer? Mm. He said, what you've got now is, we don't know how you got it. It's, it's in the bad luck division. But he said, I believe that with your healthy body, he said, when you have an immunotherapy drug, it doesn't work unless it can boost your own immune system, your own fighting ability. Right. And I think you've got a pretty good immune system from all the tests we've done. So I would give you a pretty good chance for survival. And just those words, and it's a bit, it's the same as a vaccine. Should I have the COVID vaccine? Hmm. Well, UNICEF. You know what UNICEF is the acronym for? United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. Yep. It was formed in 1946 to help kids who've been victims of the Second World War. Now, there are now 109 countries involved. Yep. Vaccinations in the last 70 years have saved 3 million lives a year. So yep. when people say, oh, that's you know, BS, um, vaccines are stupid. Let me tell you something. Vaccines only work well if you've got an immune system to boost. Oh, right. so that comes down to a personal responsibility. Yeah, Look right. at the diseases that have been eradicated. Po polio and... Poliomyelitis, I mean, that killed thousands of people. Hmm. It maimed, you know, it maimed thousands of people. Yeah. How many polio patients out of the day? None. Oh. Vaccines have eradicated them. Smallpox, how much smallpox is there in the world? None. Eradicated. German measles, 
like the anti-vaxxers won't have their daughters vaccinated for rubella, German measles. Mm. No, 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 the vaccine's no good, you know, it gives you autism and all that sort of absolute crap. I mean, show me the science where vaccinations cause autism. It's all fraudulent. It's made up. You know, it's the anti-vaxxers research is, it's Facebook and all those famous things, right? Yeah. So rubella causes birth defects, stillborn babies. Why don't you get a vaccination? Oh, it doesn't work. It's stupid. I'm not putting myself at risk. What at the risk of having a stillborn baby in, with birth defects? Mm. All that stuff's gone for people to get vaccinated pre-pregnancy with the rubella vaccine. So you can go on, you know, diphtheria, whooping cough, and all that sort of things. It's, it's mm. minuscule in the world today because of one thing, vaccines. So once again, I'm talking about immunotherapy and vaccinations. They only work to boost your own immunity. And if your immunity is close to zero, vaccines don't work. It's a bit like older people. You know, the flu vaccine doesn't work as well no. as in young people because their immune, they've let their immune system die, inactive, you know, sitting on the couch, having a few beers, two glasses of wine every night and turning on the TV and getting on, the, you know, the little kids now on the computer games, they're there for hours and hours, screen time. Mm. It should be screen time. So the activity, the coping, the eating, the skills of you looking after you, and don't forget the biggest responsibility you have as a parent, as a family member, is role modelling for your kids. Yeah. Kids will end up doing what you do. Yes, so, very conscious of that. We're uh, diagnosed with cancer, so you've obviously survived that now. And um, and uh, what was the? They gave you what fifteen months to live, but you. You know, no, you... Dr. Google gave me between uh, between three months and two years. So the average uh, survival of primary CNS lymphoma was around about the 15-month mark. Yeah, so I'm, I'm 11 years later now. And uh, my legacy before I leave this world is to, number one, get Australia to be the second country in the world that bans... Oh, you can't ban smoking. You're, that's a nanny state. I said, well... Would you rather 50 people get killed a day by the biggest, most dangerous killer product ever marketed in Australia? Yeah. What do you mean? What, bigger than atom bombs? I said, bigger than atom bombs. I mean, smoking since the Second World War is, in Australia has killed 1.4 million Australians. 27,000 of us died in the Second World War. 27,000. And smoking's yeah. killed 1.4 million people. And don't forget, Zahir, 10% of smoking deaths are in people who don't smoke. It's called secondhand smoke. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. That's insane. So smoking causes stillbirths. It causes genetic defects. It causes prem labour. It, it, causes, it causes thousands of asthma attacks, secondhand smoke. Kids raced off the hospital because of an asthma attack. Some of them died. Whose fault is it? The smoker. Mm. Smoking in Australia, by the way, is banned in prisons but it's okay in your house. <laughs> I mean, figure that. I mean, our, our government have a thing called the ACCC, the mm. Australian Competition and Consumer Department, right? Yeah. Safety law number one in Australia, all products you supply must be safe. So why do big tobacco get an exemption to kill 50 of us today? Makes no sense. Yeah, they, don't forget the government gets nine billion a year in sales tax from allowing the death there it is. of a thousand people. I mean, go figure. I mean, are we dumb or stupid? <laughs> before I let you go, I think you've answered all my questions uh, before I asked them, so thank you for that. <laughs> but um, I just so, want to... Yeah, um, yeah so th thank you for allowing me to... No, no, it's, it's, it's an honour and it's a pleasure, but I just want to ask you a couple quick things. Um, so with carbohydrates, I know you spoke about it and why, why, why it's essential. There's just so much out there these days about the keto diets, you know, take carbs out of your system. I mean, my, I, I was very blessed because my father is a biochemist and he, he knew a lot about food and taught me a lot. And then I came across people like yourselves and your books and that just added to everything I needed to know to actually how to live a healthy life. Don't do it perfectly, but getting there. But, you know, I've always been a big believer in carbohydrates because it gives you energy. 
And, yes, uh, it goes to the brain. Don't forget your brain. 80% of your brain power comes from glucose, which is, see, th there are three carbohydrates. There is a Greek word called saccharide, which is sugar. Yeah. Now, saccharides come in three varieties. There's monosaccharides is one mo molecule of sugar. There are only three monosaccharides in life. Glucose, galactose, and fructose. Yes. Now, you eat fruit 100% of the time and eat nothing, nothing else but fruit. Fruit, fructose, single molecule, rapidly absorbed into your bloodstream. So if you eat fruit all day and sit in front of a computer all day, then go to bed, you'll get fat. Hmm. If you're energetic and you're training to run a marathon and you run all day, you'll burn up the fructose. Hmm. So halfway in, in between there, if you eat a little bit of fruit and you're relatively active, then you're fruit sugar is fine. fine. Hmm. Now, vegetables are what we call um, polysaccharides, where all the carbohydrates, sugar molecules are stuck together. So if yeah. you eat vegetables all day, you can't get fat because the absorption rate is about two calories a minute of poly, yeah. <clears throat> um, polysaccharides, vegetables. Hmm. So if you eat vegetables all day, uh, you can't get fat. If you eat fruit all day, you can, but it's, it's the balance of life, okay? Yeah. Now, when you burn calories or burn kilojoules, there are 4.2 kilojoules in a calorie, uh, in a pound of fat, there's three and a half thousand calories. So let's say you want to burn a pound of fat or half a kilo of fat. Hmm. When you're sitting there, you're burning 50 calories an hour, 200 kgs. Uh, when you're sleeping, you're burning 35 to 40. When you're walking around the office, you're burning 80 calories an hour. Hmm. When you're walking, you burn 300 calories an hour. So if you put on a pound, let's say you have a cup of coffee, there's one calorie, a cup of tea is one calorie, but we don't have one cup of black coffee. We have a cappuccino or a latte. So that's 120 calories. Yeah. And people say, yeah, but I only have one sugar. Well, that's 17 extra calories. And if you have two sugars in four coffees, that's eight, one, eight, seven, that's 100, <coughs> 120 calories. Hmm. So in 30 days, you're putting on a pound, half a kilo, just having a sugar or two in your coffee mm. and you're having a cappuccino instead of a black coffee or a cup of tea. Mm. Ah, okay. So yeah, but I'm going to burn up the pound, the half a kilo by walking. Okay. So all right, you put on a pound, I want you to burn the pound. So go and walk for 12 hours. You'll burn the pound. What? 12 hours? <laughs> I'm working. I said, ah. Oh. But you just put on a pound of fat that you don't need. So you're going to have to walk for 12 hours to burn it off. Like, do you get it? Oh, but I'll, I'll, go, I'll go harder. I'm going to, <clears throat> I'm going to swim. Well, it's, it's four or 500 calories an hour. You're going to swim for an hour, are you? Oh, well, I'll run. Mm. Okay, well, that's seven, 800 calories an hour. So you're going to have to run for only four and a half hours to burn the pound. Oh, really? So if you cross country ski, you burn thousand calories an hour oh but how do i go skiing i said you've got to go up the mountain sit in your car and eat, eat snacks on the way and put on two pounds you got to <laughs> ski very hard to burn off extra pounds by oh by the way zahir sex is 400 calories an hour <laughs> so two minutes is 13 calories <laughs> so it's easier not to put the stuff in the hole in your face yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Save a lot of time. Oh, that's, that's, that's last last thing. If yes. you would like for your group or your company to have a seminar with Dr. John, yes, a bit of fun and some absolutely take home great take home take home value. I was yeah. lucky enough to have my own TV show across America on PBS on three hundred channels. Yeah. <laughs> so I have. A history of being able to change lives and, and save a lot of lives. Yes. So corporate presentation is a few grand, but I do it for half price on, on Zoom. Okay, great. Three or four. Um, if you want to book uh, my website, I don't know whether you're going to put my website up. It's, we will, um, definitely. Absolutely. And and your books and references. They are, they are johndekel.com. Yes, yeah, so you're going to buy a book and that's posted out. 
Absolutely. Like mail and uh, there's great books there. One of the ones you mentioned are here is everything in moderation except laughter, sex, vegetables and fish. Yes. I was lucky enough to meet George Burns. He's one of my heroes in life. Oh, yeah. Uh, George Burns lived till he was 100. He laughed his way through life. And I said to him when I met him in New York when he was 99, <clears throat> excuse me, George, are you going to live till you're 100? He said, yeah. I said, uh, what's your secret? He said, everything in moderation except four things. I said, what are they? He said, uh, you can overdo laughter, sex, vegetables and fish. He said, not all together, though. It makes an awful mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. uh, it's interesting when George Burns turned 100 he was interviewed by one of the media guys and they said George like you're not a fanatic are you he said no he said well, what's your doctor say about you still puffing away on a cigar now and again he said my doctor's dead <laughs> yeah, anyway, a have a great life a long life and I was going to wish you good luck. You don't need good luck. You need good management of self and good role modelling for your family. God bless you. Thanks so much for spending time with us, Dr. Tickell. I'm sure so many people will be not only inspired, but use their brain a bit better now and actually do the right things by, by themselves. So thanks again. See you soon. Thank you.